Good morning, everybody, and many thanks to Victor and to Story for inviting me to give the keynote. I'm very honored to do that. Um, please note my conflict of interests displayed prominently here, as they should always be. And uh, I want to use this uh, 30 minutes, and how do I control the slides from here? This way? Nope. Green button. Got it. Thank you. I'd like to spend the 30 minutes in two ways. First is to give you some background about the revolution that is occurring and has occurred over the last decade and a half in cancer treatment because this is an amazing time for cancer. And I'm thrilled that uh, this at the rest of the day is going to be devoted to really exploring that in some detail. And in the second part of my presentation, I'd like to tell you a story from my own laboratory about a new signaling pathway that we discovered that we think can uh, reprogram what we're calling a hostile tumor microenvironment. So let's get going. Uh, as Story alluded to, this is an amazing time for cancer. Uh, we've made great progress, but we have much, much further to go. Cancer deaths are the highest cause of death in the ages 45 to, 50 to 64 and will soon succeed cardiovascular disease in those of us who are over 65. Interestingly, the proportion of the U.S. population that dies from cancer has not really changed, and that's probably because we're all getting older and the biggest risk for cancer, of course, is aging. Now, we've made some excellent progress in some cancers, like breast cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma, lymphoma, acute lymphocytic leukemia, Sidney Farber from Dana-Farber was the individual who first showed that you could cure a child with ALL by chemotherapy, and he received a lot of skepticism at the time that he was poisoning these young kids with chemo, but he said, look, 100% of them are going to die anyway, so let's try it, and it worked. But there are some cancers that have proven incredibly intransigent, totally resistant to all of the therapies we've, tri we've tried, and that includes ovarian cancer and glioblastoma and um, pancreatic cancer. These are cancers with which we've made very, very little progress. So what are the, what I consider the key innovations in cancer treatment? And you're going to hear a lot more about these in detail this afternoon. Cancer genomics, the understanding that each tumor has a unique genetic mutation and that if we can develop drugs against that unique genetic mutation, we can have astounding responses. And you'll hear a lot about that from uh, Levi Garraway's panel. Uh, Nellie Polyak from Dana-Farber is on that panel as well. I'm going to talk about immuno-oncology and how we activate the immune system. Epigenetics, the third code, the code that lies above the DNA, um, and that is basically taking a cancer cell and make, making it go backwards and turning it into a normal cell. And I don't think we're going to talk much about that this, this afternoon, but it's an, it's an emerging area that has aroused a lot of excitement. And then, of course, prevention and early detection, and you're going to hear from Ken Offit and others about uh, some of the new uh, advances that have been made there. So at Dana-Farber, um, we have uh, plunged full speed into cancer genomics, as have other uh, leading cancer centers. We now offer every patient who crosses the threshold of Dana-Farber the ability to have their tumor sequenced in the hopes that we will find a genetic mutation for which a drug exists. And if a drug does not currently, is not currently FDA approved, out of the 800 clinical trials that Dana-Farber does every year, we will find a clinical trial for that patient, or we will ask our medicinal chemist, we have a very strong medicinal chemistry group at Dana-Farber, start working on this particular genetic mutation and find us a drug. So we now have a very large portfolio. We have probably close to 30,000 now cancer patients whose genomes we have in their medical record. And you'll hear a lot more about this. But it is clear that targeted therapy like this does benefit patients. If you look at patients with lung cancer who were treated with a drug called osimertinib, which attacks the EGFR receptor, 
If you look at those patients who had that specific mutation, you can see that their lifespan is prolonged if they have that mutation. But if they don't have that mutation, they die sooner and, uh, and with a higher uh, mortality rate. So it does work, but, and here's an example of that. This is a patient who, as you can see, had a substantial lung cancer. It turned out he had a mutation in a gene called alkinase, which is present in 4% of lung cancer patients. He was put on a drug, crizotinib, and he has now been cancer-free for seven years. So that's great. That is an exceptional responder uh, in cancer genomics. But that is not usually the case because, as Tori said, the tumor is usually smarter than we are, and it will develop resistance to those targeted drugs, develop other mutations, and the patients will relapse. So we need other avenues of approach. We can't just rely on these targeted therapeutics, remarkable as they are. And that brings us to the topic of cancer immunotherapy. And I want to give you a little history about the cancer of immunotherapy. This was uh, on, the, on the front page of Nature and Science several years ago um, when after many, many decades of trying and failing to activate our own immune systems against the tumor, uh, we finally achieved some success. It was known for years that the number of immune cells that infiltrate a tumor is correlated with the prognosis of that patient. And you can see that here. If you have tumor cells that surround the tumor, you do better than if you don't have those cells. And in particular, you need a particular kind of T cell, which we call a type 1 immune T cell. And it is, a, it is the subset of T cells that are responsible for anti-tumor immunity, and they express a transcription factor, which my laboratory isolated many years ago, called TBET, which is a master regulator of type 1 immunity uh, in the immune system. How did this all start? It started over 100 years ago with a New York City surgeon named William Coley. And Dr. Coley noted, and, and here I want to make a point here, and that is that an observant physician at the bedside is critical. It isn't just going bench to bedside. It is going bedside back to bench. As somebody like Sam Fear, my good buddy, knows better than I do, and he was an observant physician. He noticed that when he removed the tumors from some young patients, they happened to be sarcomas, I believe, and the wound got infected, that some of those tumors, which ordinarily would recur, did not come back. And so he postulated that there must be some endogenous system that is responding to the bacteria in the wounds, becoming activated, and at the same time killing off the tumor. So he decided he would bottle this special substance up by taking bacterial lysates from these patients and calling them Coley's toxins. And he sold bottles of Coley's toxins, and they actually worked for some patients. But he met with a lot of skepticism, as you can imagine. And frankly, you know, some of the best research and some of the most important discoveries are met with a lot of skepticism. So as a scientist, you have to really be willing to persist and pursue. In any case, it was supplanted by chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And for years, decades after that, scientists really worked hard. I mean, we immunologists worked really hard at trying to figure out how do you activate your immune system to recognize what is foreign? Because that's what the immune system does. It recognizes bacteria, it recognizes viruses, recognizes allergens, pathogens of all kinds. And tumor cells are foreign proteins, have foreign proteins on their surface. And the T cell should recognize them and kill them. And probably 99% of the time, the T cell does that. It's, it surveys the immune system and it sees that there's a few cells there that don't look like self and it kills them. But obviously, that doesn't work all the time. So I have a simple brain, and I like to categorize where we are in immunotherapy by putting the four major approaches that are being taken now uh, into buckets. And the first bucket is checkpoint blockade. I'll say a few words about that in a minute. 
The second bucket you'll hear a lot about from the, one of the pioneers in the field, Carl June, who's going to talk about adoptive T-cell therapy. And then, of course, there are cancer vaccines. I mean, I have two grandsons, and I look to a future where our children can be immunized against all cancer, just as they're immunized now against measles, mumps, and rubella, and polio. And that we do have a great cancer vaccine, and Doug Lowy is going to talk about that. We have a vaccine against HPV and HPV-induced cancers. No woman should have cervical cancer. We should not have HPV-induced head and neck or anal cancers. But the uptake of this vaccine in the United States is 45% in young girls and boys. That's a disgrace, and I know Doug will talk more about that. And then finally, the area that I've been working on, which is the tumor microenvironment. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. So as Story said, the real breakthrough came with uh, really compelling work from Jim Allison, and again, a lot of skepticism. He said, I believe there's going to be an inhibitory receptor on the T cell, and we should be able to block that receptor with an antibody so-called checkpoint blockade. And he worked for years to get a pharmaceutical company to become interested in this. And they finally did, and that was actually Bristol-Myers Squibb. I used to serve on the board of Bristol-Myers Squibb, and it was Bristol-Myers Squibb that said, maybe he's, maybe he's right here, so let's develop an antibody. Jim postulated that, our, that cancer leads to, ex because of the substances it secretes, leads to exhaustion of T cells. They can't recognize the tumor, or even if they recognize it, they can't become type 1 T cells, anti-tumor T cells. And so his discovery led to the drug ipilimumab, and that blocks a receptor that he discovered, CTLA-4. That's been shown to be successful in melanoma with some durable remissions. Stage 4 metastatic melanoma was a death sentence 15 years ago. 20% of the patients with stage 4 melanoma that were treated with this drug are alive today with no obvious signs of disease. That's pretty remarkable. And then a second major discovery occurred independently in three different labs at the same time. Dr. Gordon Freeman from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Dr. Tasika Hanjo from Kyoto, and Dr. Lipin Chen from Yale University discovered a second inhibitory receptor, PD-1 or PDL one it's ligand. And there have now been a number of drugs out in the market from Bristol-Myers Squibb, from Merck, from AstraZeneca, uh, and from Roche, and they have been successful to some degree in treating a much wider group of cancers. Eight different cancers now have FDA approval. Those include not only melanoma, but uh, lung cancer, head and neck, bladder, kidney, Hodgkin's lymphoma, liver, Merkel cell, and a subset of rectal cancer that's called MSI high because it has a lot of mutations, and gastroesophageal cancer. So we could say, well, gee, we're done. I mean. We've done it. Cancer immunotherapy works, and it, it works in a lot of cancers. But here's the problem. There are only eight cancers that are immunoresponsive nowadays. And it is only a minority of patients with those eight cancers who respond to immunotherapy. So that's why I say we're at the end of the beginning or the tip of the iceberg in cancer immunotherapy. You're going to hear about CAR T cells from Carl June, so I'm not going to um, uh, dwell on this particular slide, but this is a living drug that is taken from the patient, expanded, genetically manipulated, and reinfused back. It works for some blood cancers. Um, it's expensive because it's personalized for each patient, but there's so much new technology going on that you'll hear about from Carl about off the shelf CAR T cells further genetic manip manipulation of CAR T-cells so that they can work in solid tumors, um, and, and, and I think you'll enjoy uh, hearing more about that. In the meantime, though, one of our faculty members at Dana-Farber, Kathy Wu, has actually made a personalized tumor vaccine. 
Um, this is, I want to make very clear, was an early phase one study. It was only six patients, although it was later confirmed by another group in Germany. And she took six patients with melanoma who had stage three or stage four disease. And she developed a personalized vaccine by taking their tumors and figuring out what were the key foreign proteins that were on the surface of those tumors that the T cell should be recognizing but isn't. And she made a personalized vaccine for each of those six patients. She injected it into the patients. Four of the patients went into remission. And the other two patients, who had previously not responded to checkpoint blockade, i.e. ipilimumab or, or, or any of the PD-1 blockers, then responded, after they'd been immunized with the vaccine, to PD-1 blockers. So that raises, I think, the obvious theme, and you're going to hear it throughout the day, that what we're really looking for is combination immunotherapy. We need to not just do checkpoint blockade or just CAR T cells or just vaccines. We need to combine them in various ways without causing excessive toxicity. So now I want to turn to some of our own work and our own work um, focuses on what I'm calling the tumor microenvironment. So if you take a biopsy of a patient's tumor, what you're going to see is about 50% tumor cells, but surrounding those tumor cells is a neighborhood that's highly immunosuppressive. And that neighborhood is comprised of many different kinds of immune cells, innate or adaptive immune cells, it's comprised of stromal cells, fibroblasts, endothelial cells sitting around the tumor. So if you think of the tumor as a castle, you can think of this tumor microenvironment as being a big moat around that castle. A host I mean, this is not Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. <laughs> this is really a hostile microenvironment. And even if you activate a T cell with checkpoint blockade, if it can't get into the tumor, if it can't get across the moat, if there's no bridge across that moat, it's not going to be able to kill the tumor. And this is an area that is, a, is arousing now, finally, more interest among cancer researchers, but also, I would say, is still in its infancy. So we believed that current immunotherapies, the checkpoint blockades, the CAR T cells, they fail because you have this highly immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And there are myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and there are um, these subset of regulatory T cells that turn off the immune system. And there are lots of immunosuppressive hormone-like molecules that are secreted by the tumor or secreted by these myeloid or, or dendritic cells or the, these innate immune cells that surround the tumor. And so they can't help out. In fact, they prevent the T cells from doing their job. And we had discovered probably 20 years ago, at least 20 years ago, a key transcription factor, which we gave the very boring name of Xbox binding protein 1, uh, which it turns out to be a key player, the key player in a very elegant signaling pathway first identified by Peter Walter called the endoplasmic reticulum stress response. And over the last few years, we have shown that silencing this pathway does two major things. It directly kills tumor cells themselves because a tumor cell is living in an environment that is stressful. And so it has very high levels of endoplasmic reticulum stress. And I'll say a little bit more about what ER stress is. If you silence ER stress in a tumor cell, it will die. And we showed that first in, I think, 2003 in myeloma cells. It was confirmed by Rhonda Pinot. 
um, and most recently um, uh, published a paper uh, in Nature in 2014 showing that was true also for triple negative breast cancer cells. And other labs now have shown that that is the case in many other cells. If you can cripple the ER stress response, the tumor will die. But the second thing that this signaling pathway does, which I have to admit was a surprise to us, was that silencing it activates anti-tumor immunity. And it does so in many of the cells in this immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. Now, we started out by looking at dendritic cells, but I'll, I'll mention a word about a couple of other cell types. So what is the unfolded protein or ER stress response? As I mentioned, it is a really elegant pathway um, from the endoplasmic reticulum to the nucleus. And its function is to protect cells from stress. And that stress can be delivered by the presence of misfolded or unfolded proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum, but it also can be activated by low pH, by absence of enough glucose, nutrient deprivation, low pH, and reactive oxygen species, all of which characterize the tumor microenvironment. In yeast, where Peter Walter discovered this system, there was only one ER stress pathway. And that's the pathway that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But in mammalian cells, there actually are three ER stress sensors. Um, and each of them uh, do different, somewhat different things. But the most evolutionarily conserved one is driven by an uh, enzyme called IRE1. And IRE1 carries out its job by activating the transcription factor that we isolated. Again, that was by chance that we isolated it, called XBP1. So if you think about the tumor microenvironment, as I said, it's a hostile environment. It's, it's hypoxic. There's not enough nutrients for the tumor cell. And you also have the effect of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, which also activate the ER stress response. And then, of course, there are genetic mutations uh, that are introduced into the tumor cell, and that also can activate the ER stress response. And that activates what we call the unfolded protein or ER stress response. There are the three arms. We're going to talk about IRE1, but these are three uh, transmembrane ER sensors that live in the ER membrane, and this is what they do. They, they serve a useful purpose in normal cells by helping proteins fold correctly and get translated and secreted, but if the system is disturbed, then those cells die, which is a good thing when we're talking about cancer. So IRE1 is, a, is an unusual enzyme. It, it sits as a monomer in the in the uh, membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. Its cytosolic domain contains a kinase domain, and the kinase domain autophosphorylates IRE1, and then it dimerizes. So the active form is a dimer that is phosphorylated, self-phosphorylated. There have been no other known substrates for that kinase. Now, the interesting thing is that that kinase domain also activates a very unusual endoribonuclease domain, which converts the transcription factor, XBP1, from an inactive transcription factor into a very potent transcription factor by splicing out a little bit of the sequence of XBP1 and putting it into a different reading frame, you get activation. And that's important because XBP1 then controls many different genetic programs in the nucleus. It induces the expression of chaperones and ER-associated degradation machinery. It, it, it allows the ER to expand. Um, it, it assures quality control. And so what I want to show, tell you about is a little story of what this does to the immune system in one of the cancers that we all know has proven to be very intransigent, and that's ovarian cancer. And this is the work of Juan Cubillos Ruiz, who's now an assistant professor at Weill Cornell. And Juan um, came to the lab very interested, uh, had done his work 
uh, his PhD work on dendritic cells in ovarian cancer, and he came to the lab with the express purpose of figuring out whether this ER stress pathway had anything to do with the immune system. And ovarian cancer is not a good cancer to have. If you can catch it early, which is the exception, 15% of patients present early, you can cure it by surgery. But most women present with vague symptoms of abdominal pain, discomfort, change in bowel habits, and noticing that their abdomens are swelling. And by that time, it's too late. The cancer has metastasized to the per throughout the peritoneal cavity, and the um, overall five-year survival rates for ovarian cancer are dismal, absolutely dismal. So what Juan did was to ask whether in ovarian cancer, these very dysfunctional dendritic cells, and dendritic cells are small cells discovered by Ralph Steinman. He won the Nobel Prize on his deathbed uh, because he died of pancreatic cancer. Uh, a cell discovered by Ralph Steinman, again, a lot of skepticism. Didn't get his grants, he didn't get his papers published because nobody will believe this cell existed. Well, it turns out this is the key cell that activates T cells. And if this cell is exhausted and immunosuppressed, you will not activate T cells. And it's immunosuppressed, it secretes all these factors that encourage the growth of blood vessels that nourish the tumor, it expresses all these immunosuppressive molecules, and it's unable to activate the T cell. What Juan asked was, is it because dendritic cells have high levels of ER stress that they are making this a hostile tumor microenvironment? And what he did to, ask, to answer that question was to specifically genetically delete either IRE1 or XBP1, doesn't matter, the results are the same, specifically in dendritic cells in a couple different models of ovarian cancer in animals. And when he did that, you can see that the animals that did not express IRE1 or XBP1 in dendritic cells were activated. They activated T cells, and as a consequence, you can see that the ovarian tumors on the bottom of the panel are much smaller than they are in, in oh, their litter mate controls, and these animals tumor volume is decreased, they also survive longer. I like this particular model because it's what we call a GEM model. It's a model where the two most common genetic mutations in, in people with ovarian cancer are duplicated in an animal, and that's KRAS P53. So it looks as much like the human as one can make it. But as I said, most ovarian cancer prevent presents as highly metastatic disease, and so Juan also asked if we ablate either of these proteins in dendritic cells, what happens in metastatic cancer after you've injected a very aggressive ovarian cancer cell line, and found similar results. Survival is prolonged. You, you can see that compared to the, all the peritoneal metastases you see in the wild-type animals, in those that have deleted XBP1 selectively in dendritic cells. Those dendritic cells are active, they're activating T cells, and you don't see peritoneal tumors there. So what, the mechanism by which this works is complicated. I don't have time to explain it, but we were able to demonstrate that when you take these dendritic cells that lack the expression of this signaling pathway, they're now able to activate type 1 T cells, and those type 1 T cells now make the anti-tumor cytokine interferon gamma and granzyme B, and they're able to attack the tumor and kill it. Another interesting and unexpected finding was at the same time, by means that we don't understand yet, you actually get a decrease in the number of these suppressive cells called T regulatory cells. So there are fewer of those, but there are more of the very activated type 1 anti-tumor T cells. And so we wanted to test this proof of principle because in ovarian cancer, nothing works. Checkpoint blockade doesn't work, vaccines don't work, adoptive T cell therapy doesn't work, at least 
uh, so as far as I know, there may be some promising uh, data coming from, from other laboratories. Uh, but there's really no success. Now, we do have the new PARP inhibitors, which are making some impact uh, in ovarian cancer, but it's a pretty tough disease. And so we asked, what happens if you, if you take nanoparticles that encompass, that surround what we call an, a, an siRNA? So we've, we've knocked down the expression of this pathway in tumor-resident dendritic cells. So if you inject this, these nanoparticles that encapsulate these siRNAs, um, and you've, you haven't completely wiped out the expression of XBP1 or IRE1, but you've markedly diminished it. If you inject them in an animal who has already metastatic disease, what happens is that you increase the anti-tumor immune responses by evoking the type 1 immune T cell. And you can see that here, just looking at the bars for interferon gamma and granzyme B in the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. You get much more interferon gamma, much more granzyme B, and sure enough, the tumor recedes. So that led us to say, well, you know, we're go you're going to hear about uh, adoptive cell therapy from Carl for T cells. But the field is expanding, and now people are looking at natural killer cells, and we thought, well, maybe dendritic cells could help. What if we, at the time of surgery, in a woman who has advanced disease, we take the ascites out, we purify dendritic cells, we silence XBP1 or IRE1, and then we put them back in. Now, we haven't obviously done this in patients yet, but we've done it in mice, and when we do that, these adoptively transferred dendritic cells that lack ER stress can, are actually dominant, and they can overcome the immunosuppressive dendritic cells that are present in the mouse already and have a significant effect on survival and tumor volume, as you can see here in this slide. So one possibility is, you know, could we consider this as an adoptive dendritic cell therapy in these patients by infusing through a port. After the tumor has been debulked, patient's been on chemotherapy, now you can introduce these uh, silenced dendritic cells. But this pathway is not only important in dendritic cells. It turns out it's important in myeloid-derived suppressor cells, which are another very, very immunosuppressive component of the tumor microenvironment, and a very nice work from Dmitry Gabrilovich's lab, which we've confirmed. Uh, if you take these myeloid-derived suppressor cells and treat them with an IRE1 inhibitor, you can turn them into active macrophages or neutrophils that will kill the tumor. So when you think of the tumor microenvironment, now we've shown that you can reprogram dendritic cells, you can reprogram myeloid-derived suppressor cells, and most recently in a paper we have uh, that I think is maybe online in nature, we have shown that this also works if you directly target T cells. And here we've done a genetic deletion of IRE1 or XBP1 specifically in T cells, and those T cells now get converted from exhausted immunosuppressive T cells into activated tumor-killing T cells. And the mechanism is entirely different than what we saw either from myeloid-derived suppressor cells or for, dendr for dendritic cells. In this case, we are talking about changing the metabolism of the T cell. And this is another major theme in cancer therapeutics today, is metabolism because T cells are living in an environment that is very immunosuppressive and it's glucose deprived. So how do we reshape and reprogram the metabolism in T cells? And it turns out, somewhat to our surprise, that if you silence this pathway in T cells, you now control the mitochondrial function of those T cells and you completely reverse 
the metabolic dysfunction that you see in T-cells who are being starved of glucose. They can now say, okay, we don't have glucose, but we're going to use, utilize a different substrate, and that is glutamine. And many exciting papers have been published. Lou Cantley is, is one of the, the, the leaders of this field, for sure. And, and so we've shown here that if you silence this pathway, you, you can restore metabolic fitness in these T cells, and they now can kill the tumor. So to summarize, ER stress, we believe, has the capacity to reprogram this hostile neighborhood. I mean, maybe we can kind of put one of those sweater vests on that Mr. Rogers always wore. I don't know about you, but I could never stand that TV show. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, we'd like to import, we'd like to call this Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And we think that by playing around with this pathway and silencing it, we can restore dendritic cell function we can activate the capacity of type 1 anti-tumor T cells, and we can reverse myeloid-derived suppressor cell function. We also can change the secreted substances that characterize this tumor microenvironment and get rid of these immunosuppressive cytokines like TGF-beta and IL-10 and replace them with an anti-tumor cytokine like interferon gamma. And at the same time, we reduce the number of these so-called regulatory T cells. Because we believe that this is a possibility, we have founded a company, and that was on my conflict of interest slide, to try to develop and identify very, very potent small molecules that inhibit this enzyme. Enzymes are good targets for drug discovery, and Kayvon Shokat will speak more about um, how one creates uh, small molecules uh, that are, uh, work to inhibit cancer. And the, the beauty of this particular pathway is that it's a double whammy, because if you can inhibit it, you will get direct inhibition of tumor growth at the same time that you're activating anti-tumor immunity. So um, fingers crossed that we can come up with some of these potent small molecule inhibitors and then uh, hope that they work not just in mice but also in humans because we've cured a lot of mice of cancer and um, hasn't translated to the human. But we have much better systems nowadays. We have many technologies that are just blooming right now where we can recreate the human tumor microenvironment ex vivo and use that as a way, and, and, and this is, includes technologies like organoids um, where you can recreate the tumor in a bottle, as it were, and that's going to prove very useful for testing new drugs and for testing combinations of drugs, and that will help our patients. And with that, I thank you so much for listening, and I particularly want to acknowledge Juan Cubillos Ruiz uh, and Minkyung Song, who was a graduate student that Juan and I co-mentored for the work on, on T-cells. Thank you.